Welcome to The Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. Hello to all God's precious people out there in radio and TV land. This is Sylvia Pierce on The Liberating Secret. I'm so glad to be with you today. Uh, I'm doing a series today. I'm beginning a series calling it The Corinthian Letters. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, briefly go through some of the major points in 1 Corinthians, but I'm really headed towards 2 Corinthians. One of my very favorite letters in the whole New Testament is 2 Corinthians, I guess, because the 2 Corinthians certainly addresses you know, the problems that ministers and teachers and preachers and all of us might have and might slip into. And I think that's very important and refreshing for us to certainly consider. So, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to start in 1 Corinthians, um, and I'm going to read probably the first and second, parts of the first and second chapters, because we want to look at exactly what was, what were the issues, what were the issues that Paul um ran into in the Corinthian church. First of all, uh, Corinth was west of Athens in Greece, and on Paul's second missionary trip is when he established the church by preaching the gospel to them, and so he certainly was their father in the spirit. And um, that was probably 50 AD, so uh, and just in, in, in only six years already, the church was pretty much in a mess. And basically, this church was, uh, they, were bo- they were born again um, but, and filled with the Spirit, but basically they came out of paganism and a lot of, you know, Greek philosophy. So, because they were close to Athens, of course, which was the center of Greek philosophy. So um, there, was a, a, there was a lot that rose up in this church that would cause contention and a lot of divisions. And so I, to me, I think it's important to bring this, this letter out at this time because I feel like the churches in America are basically doing the same thing. I always say that about Paul's letters because they're pretty apropos to what we're experiencing today. We certainly can apply them to what we see today. And so some of the issues that Paul was addressing in this uh, first Corinthian letter was um, some of the problems were immorality. Uh, They were certainly, uh, there was incest. They were uh, uh, um, drinking blood, sacrificed to idols. And uh, uh, so see, they really hadn't left their paganism, they still certainly were still involved in trying to mix paganism with Christianity, which it does not mix because it cannot mix. And like in the, in the letter of Galatians, um, what was happening, the, the legalistic uh, Jews who, who called themselves Christians were really um, perverting the gospel there in Galatians. So as soon as Paul leaves a place, I mean, I think we really need to consider the anguish and the pain and the frustrations that Paul had uh, establishing these early churches and establishing them in the faith so that they might get settled in the faith and not be taken away by every wind of doctrine. And actually, Paul calls it doctrine of demons. And so... And, and so we, we start understanding what happens when the gospel, the true gospel of grace, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, when, when a church or a group of people is, are established in this gospel, then immediately Satan comes in to pervert and to um, uh, mix, mix go- grace and works together and mix paganism in with Christianity. So they're, so he's doing it in order to pervert the gospel to actually stop the, um, the move of the Holy Spirit in, in areas because he certainly is the enemy of the Holy Spirit. So uh, and Paul had a lot of this, these frustrations in his life. 
And in the second, in the eleventh chapter of Second Corinthians, Paul talks about a lot of his physical uh, encounters with being beaten and being stoned and um, shipwrecked and bitten by snakes, and certainly his is pretty autobiographical autobiography about his uh, life. Uh, but basically his main frustrations was what he had to experience with these early Christians getting them established in the faith and dealing with all of the perversions that that came into these early churches. And of course because of all these perversions that came into the early churches we have these glorious New Testament letters that Paul has written. So we do thank the Lord for that. And we certainly do thank the Lord for the Corinthian, first and second Corinthians. So, but let me start reading in first Corinthians. And, and I just want you to hear the heart of Paul and hear his, this is, he's the, their father and he is writing to them. I mean, many, there were many apostles that came in so-called apostles that came in unawares and declared that to try to discredit Paul. So let me start reading in verse 4 of chapter 1. It says, I thank my God always on your behalf. So he, he always starts out as a father, loving his children and not attacking them immediately. I mean, I know that when I was growing up, my dad was that way. He didn't attack me immediately when I did the wrong thing. He always commended me, and Paul always does that too. Paul commends them and reminds them basically of how they were saved. And he says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus Christ. So if there was any legalism, any how-tos of performance that certainly uh, always would creep into these new churches, if it was there, then you see he addressed it immediately by saying that, that the grace which was given to you by Jesus Christ, because we're saved by grace and by his mercy, and not certainly not by the works of our, of our own hands. And verse 5 says that in everything you were enriched by him. So he's not even saying, I've enriched you with the truth. He's not, you see, he's not a boaster. He's not puffed up. He's not proud. Now, some of these apostles and so-called apostles and so-called prophets were pretty puffed up and pretty impressed with themselves, you see. But Paul is always is such a humble spirit and such a mighty father to these people. And he said, you were enriched by him, by, by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus Christ, in all utterance and in all knowledge. And it says, even as the testimony of Jesus Christ confirmed in you. So that's how you began. You, you began by the Holy Spirit's confirmation of Christ being in you, which is certainly the truth of the gospel. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you, you came behind in no, no gift. So you were gifted with the Holy Spirit. And he certainly, you started off, on the road filled with the Spirit, um, you, uh, uh, manifesting the gifts of the Spirit, and they certainly were declared among you and seen among you. And, and also it says in that verse, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 8 says, who shall also confirm you unto the end? Jesus Christ is the one that will confirm us to the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ in that day. Um, we always know that that day of his coming will be the day of the Lord. The Bible is always talking about. Uh, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So you're, you were called in a fellowship to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you. So right away he's, he's addressing that issue of the divisions among them, you see. And he says, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, you see. So there were already there were divisive spirits among them, dividing them, and probably a religious spirit and puffed up spirits, um, people that 
and declared they were apostles, which they were not. Paul calls them false apostles. Actually, he says in 2 Corinthians that they, um, they pose themselves as angel of light, and they pose themselves as apostles, but they are not. And then he says, For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that, you, that there are contentions among you, divisions, contentions, arguments, strife among you. This certainly does not come from the Holy Spirit. It certainly comes from the, the, the spirits of, of the devils that have come in to cause problems among you. <coughs> Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and this is what they're boasting about. Some say, well, I'm of Paul, and others say, oh, I, oh, oh no, well, you might be of Paul, but I'm of, of Apollos, and he's greater than Paul. And some other people say, oh, no, I'm of Cephas or, or Peter. And then others might say, oh, but I'm of Christ. So you see... All these people were uh, divided over who really was their apostle, who was their leader. And, um, um, and then he says, is Christ divided? Because, see, you've actually come into the fellowship, into the body of Christ. Is Christ himself divided? So where does this come from? It certainly does not come from God. Are Paul, was Paul crucified for you? So am I your savior? the people that say you're of me am I your savior or were you baptized in the name of Paul good question I thank God that I baptized none of you so see this is really basically immaturity and um, um, carnality really carnality that there would still be divisions among them basically there's divisions among them basically because number one they do not understand their full inheritance in Christ they do not know who they are in Christ so if you're in fellowships that are saying yes we know who we are in Christ and all these divisions you know are taking place within this fellowship then this fellowship is not settled in the truth of who you really are in Christ because Christ is not divided and when you know that you're one with Christ, that's why we teach the liberating secret, because we're actually teaching oneness with our Lord Jesus Christ, that we're crucified with Christ. In other words, Christ is our head, and not, you know, men, not even Paul, the apostle. He didn't claim to be the head. He, he, he was an apostle, but he was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, called only to be a messenger of the gospel, and not certainly the head of the church. And, uh, and he says, I thank God that I, I wasn't even baptized. I didn't baptize any of you. So people get proud of all their, uh, whatever they do, you know, um, in the churches. So even the act of baptism, which is certainly one of um, uh, uh, one, the symbols of Christianity is certainly baptism. But baptism doesn't save you. I mean, this certainly testifies as that. I always say if water could save us, then we better fall down and worship water. You see, if the law can save us, we better uh, fall down and worship the law. If the church can save us, we better fall down and worship the church. You see, we're meant to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And baptism only is a testimony of our death, burial, and resurrection in Christ, being baptized into Christ is it's only a symbol of that. And certainly I'm not against water baptism. I think it's, it's wonderful. It's certainly, my, our grandson was just recently baptized. We all went to his baptism. It certainly choked us up. We're, my husband and I, Scott and I, were just choked up at that baptism. It meant so much to us. But, he, but it symbolized being baptized into Christ. He made his decision of faith, and this was a public uh, um, uh, demonstration of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, being buried with him, being buried with Christ. And so when Christ died, Jesus, uh, my grandson died with him because we all died with him. And when he was buried, he, we were buried with him, signifying that we, cannot be we can't raise ourselves from the dead. And then coming back again, 
from the dead, which is Christ certainly was resurrected from the dead, represents, of course, us coming alive again in Christ. So baptism is a wonderful symbol, but it certainly does not save us. And Paul certainly brings that out. He said, so don't be, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you all because you all would claim that I would, <laughs> that, that you were mine being baptized by me. No, you belong to Christ. You don't really belong to men, to a man, not even Paul, not even the great apostle Paul. And I baptized also the house of Stephan Stephanus Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, so I, did, I did really didn't baptize. It's not about the act of being baptized. Also, that's a wonderful thing to be baptized, and we certainly are, but it's basically a symbol. For Christ sent me not to baptize, that's not the point, but to preach the gospel. That's the point. See, we always get diverted off of the real point of what Christianity is about. I think that's Satan's biggest plan is to divert us away from the point. We get off focus. We get off centered. We're centered on baptism and the, and the rites of, that happens in Christianity. Instead of being centered in on Christ, we get centered in on herself and what we have to do instead of on the one who saved us, who's Christ. So Paul is always bringing us back and centering us back on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible does. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be of no effect. He claims that he was weak in his speech. I'm not really a public speaker, don't claim to be, but I'm certainly, is a, I am certainly a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace and uh, along with Paul. So it's not in wisdom of words. So you can have great speakers and they're not even preaching the gospel. And, people, and they tickle the ears of God's of people, but you see, they're not even telling you the truth. So it's not about wisdom of words. It's about the cross of Jesus Christ centered in on the cross. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it is the very power of God. I love that, that the cross is the very power of God. And in Romans, I, I love this verse in Romans as well, because he said that the gospel is the power of God. So it's not in the preaching of the word, but it's actually in power. It's not in word, but it's in power. What is power? Power is what will transform you. You see, it's not any words that's going to transform you. It's the power of the gospel, the power of the cross the transforming power of your accepting the cross of Christ for your deliverance, that he delivered you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. That's the power. So it isn't in words, but it's in transforming power. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 14. I am a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Um, so as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you at, who are at Rome. This is the Roman letter. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So you see, connected, the gospel certainly is the gospel of the cross. We really, we ministers of the gospel don't have anything else to talk about unless we're preaching first the preaching of the cross because it is the power of transformation. It's the power that's going to transform you. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he paid the, the, his, the price of his very life on the cross is, is the power that will deliver you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So if you're in a church, if you're in a fellowship that is not preaching and teaching Christ and Christ alone, the finished work of the Christ of the cross is the very power of deliverance that delivers you. And it's not by men's wisdom. It's not by the preaching of great words and oracles. It's not. It's not even the Bible doesn't even save you, but it's by the power of the cross himself. The cross of Christ delivers you and uh, translates you into a new kingdom. And actually, we're renewed daily by 
the by the 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 cross the cross we never really leave the cross we we stand on the cross we peg what but jesus says take up your cross you're not even going to be my disciple until you take up my cross so we never really leave the cross so the preaching of the cross is paramount in the body of Christ. And if you're going to a fellowship in a church that is not preaching the gospel, not preaching the finished work of the cross, then you better get out and find yourself a church that is, or a fellowship that is, or stay alo alone in your own house, in your own room, in with your Bible. And you read these verses about uh, Christ being uh, the finished work of the Christ and of the cross that is your deliverance. And it's not by might nor by power, but by uh, His Spirit that delivers you. So it's by the Holy Spirit of God that renews you, that teaches you, that delivers you, that brings you forth and transforms you into the new creation that God has designed you to be. Okay, now it says in verse 18, For the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but to us that are saved it is the very power of God. And I love that. It's the dynamite of God. I love that. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. So Jesus came to destroy the wisdom of the wise. So if you're just sitting down uh, at your church services and you're just hearing what you think good speeches or wise speak speeches, you see God came to destroy that. Jesus came to destroy that and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent because it's not about that. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Where is apologetics? What is all that about? You see, we can, we can start nothing but more divisions in the church with all this arguing over everything when, when the gospel is just so simple and the preaching of the cross is so simple. You see, we, we think we're too intellectual for that simplicity. And Christ, I mean, Paul says this in Corinthians. He says, oh, Satan has beguiled you away from the simplicity that's in cross he's in Christ he's diverted you from the truth and that's what his devices are i can tell you that and he ha and 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 uh, who is the disputer of this world hath not god made foolish the wisdom of this world it's really foolishness the wisdom of this world for after that in the wisdom of god the world by wisdom knew not god it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So it's simple. It's simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that saves us, you see. And that's foolishness to people. You know, people actually were a fallen race of being. We have fallen into such um, blindness and deafness and we're blinded. Second Corinthians tells us that we're, the God of this world has blinded our minds and made us interested only in, uh, in more learning, in more, under, more human understanding, and more wisdom. You see, it's not about the wisdom of this world. It's not about book learning, really. It's about learning what the Lord Jesus Christ has to teach you. Now, that certainly can come to you. There's many writings about Christ and about you know the meaning of the Bible and commentaries, and I'm certainly not putting that down. But if you're if you're just reading them to, to get more uh, human understanding, more understanding about history. And I love history myself, but you see all these things can be, be a diversion away from the point. The point is very simple. And God says it's the humble heart, it's the childlike spirit that will just simply receive Christ. Now to the wisdom of this world, that seems like just plain child's play or foolishness. And that's what God is calling us to. He says in verse 22, for the Greeks require a sign. Uh, the Jews require a sign, excuse me. The Jews are always looking for a sign. And I think, I think we Christians are always looking for signs and wonders too. I think we better stop looking for signs and wonders and get to know him. And, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And I think we Americans are so sophisticated and so into our understanding our own understanding you see proverbs says um it says get understanding get wisdom that's the principal thing you see these corinthians were lacking the wisdom of god they were going after the wisdom of the world which the greeks certainly went after and i mean the wisdom of the world can send you right to hell so you can get smarter and 
smarter and more intellectual and have more wisdom of this world and be going straight to hell. You see, it's the simplicity of the cross. Now, I'm not putting down um, high IQs, my goodness. You know, I, I would hope we would all have high IQs. But you see, we can be proud of all that be proud of our own understanding, our own wisdom, our own doctrines that we've understood and sorted out. You see, we can be proud of all those things instead of humbly coming to the Lord and being taught by the Spirit. Because a lot of times being taught by the Spirit means that you have to be childlike in your understanding. And people, maybe they wouldn't be drawn to you. Maybe they're only drawn to you because you have great, wise, worldly wisdom or the wisdom of this world because you've got all this information and you don't have very much um, and people want to hear informational truths they don't want to hear revelational truths what is really going to minister to God's people is revelation not just information you see information can send you right to hell it's revelation it's revelation from the mind of Christ that's really going to transform you and uh settle you in the things of God. And But Paul says this in verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified, which isn't very popular these days, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. I dare say that we Americans think we're so intellectual and so uh, well taught that these things are foolishness to us today. And we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're trying to embrace our own intellectual understanding and psychological understanding with the things of God and oil and, wa and water do not mix. I mean, we better be after the water of the Word that we might be washed with the water of the world, Word and not just new psychological understandings about the human. Actually, the hum you can't even understand the human being psychologically until you have the mind of Christ because it's through the mind of Christ that we understand ourselves. That's why I've done the uh, presentation that I did called What is Man? And um, uh, I might refresh your memory of that sometime. In verse 24, it says, But unto them, in other words, unto the Jews, which are called both Jews, no, but unto them, which are called unto us are them, which are called both Jews and Greek. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, I love that verse. That's one of my favorite verses. Christ in you is not only your powerful sufficiency for all things. He's also the new mind in you. You see, the new creation is Christ in you, and Christ is that power. He's not going to give you the vessel power. He is the power, but he also is your wisdom. That's why Proverbs says, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. I promise you, if Abraham had leaned on his own understanding, he would have never take, taken Isaac up to sacrifice. Nobody that is obeying God and the truths of God will, could ever lean on their own understanding because it seems like foolishness and too radical for the mind, you see, for the natural mind. I see my time's over, and I'm going to continue this next time on The Liberating Secret. For, so thank you for joining me, and may God richly bless you. Goodbye.